Uh, I meant to mention that earlier, and as I said, I didn't have my notepad, so I lost that. <laughs> but seeing poor little Sarge work so hard by, him, by himself, <laughs> my mind, my mind was stirred. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, take and turn with me to First John chapter two. And as we are continuing in our exposition of First John, I think we've come now to our seventh lesson, seventh or eighth, somewhere in there. And uh, we, we've reached verse 7. And the next little section extends through verse 11. Now, as you know, of course, when these epistles were written, they were not written in chapters and with verses. Uh, in fact, they were written in all caps with no punctuation. And mm-hmm. First John chapter 2. And they were written in all caps with no punctuation. That's the way that the Greeks, that the Greeks wrote. But nonetheless, over the years, we've kind of got it divided up into chapters and into sections. And so what we do, since we can't teach the entire epistle every time we stand up, we simply chop it up into little bites. And so the little bite that I'll feed you today comes from verse 7 down through verse 11 of chapter 2. Let's read that. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. And the old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light, and yet hates his brother, is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness, and walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's ask the Lord to bless our study. Father, we come before you with open hearts to receive your word. We come to you, Father, with our Bibles open, and we turn to the Scripture, because the Scripture is the source of our study, and it is where your truth is found, given to John, in this case, by the Holy Spirit. As we uh, study this this afternoon, I pray that you will make sure that the words that I speak concerning it are in line with what it's intended to say. It's not what I think it should say. It's not what I want it to say. It's what it says. And in addition to that, you would give me the the words with which to communicate that to those who are here and who will watch over our media. In addition, we ask that your spirit will open the hearts of all who hear. Thank you, Father, for it. And we love the study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I told you in a previous lesson, one way to approach the book of John is to approach it from the standpoint as a series of tests. Tests of what, you might ask? Of your faith. Tests of the authenticity of your stand before God. You know, I've lived all my life with people telling me there is no way that you can know whether you are right with God. You're going to have to wait until Judgment Day to find that out. What a horrible, terrible way to live one's life. The most important thing about you, it's not your jobs, it's not your family, it's not your recreation, it's not your health, it's not your finances, it's your standing to the God of heaven. And if you cannot know what that standing with him is, you are of all people most miserable. I mean, I cannot, well, I can't imagine because at one time I was there. But now I can't imagine what it would be like to wake up all day with fingers crossed saying, I hope that if this is the end, or if that Jesus is to come today, I just hope I'm okay. Using hope is wishful thinking, which is the way most people do in this world. That's not the Bible's definition of hope, by the way. But I don't want to get into that. I'll stay on that all afternoon. (laughs) But the fact is, 
can you imagine God saying, I sent my son to save you from your sin. And if you come to him, you will be forgiven of that sin. And he will give you eternal life. But you're not going to really know if you have it or not. And I'll let you know on the last day after you've died. And as I'm sentencing you to hell, you'll figure out you didn't have it. Or as I give you heaven, you'll figure out that you did. Well, you know, the bad thing about that is there's nothing I can do about it at that particular point in time. Now, to be quite honest, there ain't nothing I can do about it, period, anyway. It's not up to me. Okay? It's not about me. That whole concept, that whole idea is based upon a works-based performance of salvation. That it's about me jumping through the hoops. It's about me doing all the right things, saying all the right things, having all the right attitudes, behaving in the right way. And if I can do all of that, then God will reward me with salvation at the end for having been a good boy. Now that makes sense to us in the flesh because that's the way we operate with one another, isn't it? But there's a problem with that. God is not flesh. He's not us. He demands perfection. He demands absolute, total sinlessness before he can have fellowship with us or grant us any blessing. Well, if that's the case, we don't stand a chance, do we? I mean, just be honest with yourself. Who of you think that you perform to a high enough standard to gain eternal life? Who can, in the light of the cross, even begin to think that that's the way God had this set up? Because if that's the case, I just need to perform, and Jesus, you need to get out of the way. I don't understand why you came. I don't understand why you died. Now, there are people who believe that, and you know what they think? You know what they'll tell you? He died so God could show you how much he hated sin, so you'd be better, so you'd live a better life, and it would serve as motivation. For you to be a good person. Now that, that's that's out there in theology. Very few people believe that, <laughs> at least would admit that they believe that. But when you are, when you when you discuss with them, they believe that. No, salvation is of Christ, Christ alone. Period. End of story. I don't know what else to say to make it any clear. Okay. It's not your contribution. It's based on your faith. And 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 so then that brings up the question. Is my faith genuine? Well, one would assume if one has faith, faith is genuine. Well, I'd agree with you. Save for, there's a couple of places where I find that it's not genuine saving faith. Faith is a broad general term in the Greek. Sometimes it just means to believe. Sometimes it means just to believe the facts of something. Sometimes it contains the element of trust, okay, of loyalty. So it, it's broad. Context defines it for you. And I think we can see that. Uh, let, me, let me show you something. Go, go to James chapter 2 for just a moment. In James chapter 2, let me show you where the word belief, faith is used, but it does not equate to a saving faith. Uh, he says in verse 14, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Now there's the question. Can you have a faith that does not have a response save you? Okay. He goes on down and he says, Someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without uh, the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God? You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Okay? So let me ask you a question. Does the demons have saving faith? No. For if they did, they would no longer be what? Demons. <laughs> okay, they would be the good angels. So he says that faith without works is useless. So he's using the word faith in this instance, in a way that is not saving faith. Now, the devils believe there is a God. 
I mean, they know it more well than any human. They were there in heaven at one time, weren't they? They knew who Jesus was. It's not a question. Do you think Satan believes that Jesus was crucified? Yes, he was there. Do you believe that Satan saw him buried? Yes. Do you think Satan has not figured out that he rose? Yeah, he knows all of that. Does he believe it to be true? He has to. It's a fact. But he's not saved. So in what sense then when we say Satan is a believer, are we saying that he's a believer? Well, he's a believer, but he's not a believer. He has faith, but he doesn't have faith. And I'm not making a play on words. The context defines it for you. So just because you somewhere have said in your heart, I believe that God is, doesn't necessarily mean that you have a saving faith. Oh, I believe in Jesus. That doesn't mean that you have a faith that justifies. Now, it's interesting because poor old, most people misquote John so much. They think that John is saying here in John chapter 2 that works is the cause of your salvation. But I want to set before you today that the text shows us that he's not saying that works is the cause of your salvation. He is saying works is the proof of your salvation. Do you see the difference? You want to know whether you have a satanic faith, a belief system that's not genuine and bona fide, or one that is true? Well, James tells you how. He says, you can say you have faith, but you don't have any substantiating works that proves that. Will that kind of faith save you? That's what he says in verse 14. Of course not. He says, let me give you an example. If there's a brother or sister who's without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? So you know what's right, but you didn't act on what was right. So is, does that rise to the level of saving faith? No. He says, even so then faith, if it has no works, if what you say you believe is genuine, there will be actions that demonstrate that. He is not saying you will then have your faith because you worked your way into heaven. He's, that, that's to get this whole context backwards. Okay? So works then would be one way to demonstrate whether your faith is bona fide and true. But you know even that is not foolproof. Can an uh, atheist do a good deed? Can a person who, who doesn't believe help somebody be warmed and filled? They certainly can, can't they? In fact, there are many uh, agencies that are set up and run by people with no religious basis whatsoever that feed the hungry and, and clothe the naked. You, you know what I'm saying? They, they, but the people aren't doing it in the name of God. See, for it to be genuine faith, there has to be the action, and the action has to be motivated for what? Somebody to pat you on the back? Motivated by your desire to see God glorified and reflect His love through your heart to this world. That's, that's what true, true faith does. Okay, True faith is based on three points. Knowing the truth. Okay, Noticia in the Latin. Okay, And, and uh, then there's a sensius. That is, you agree with it. And then there is, last of all, fuditia, which means trust. So you have to have three elements to true saving faith. So, so James is saying here, you can talk about your faith all day long, but if your faith is genuine, one of the things that will be true about it is it can be demonstrated, it will be seen. And we already know that Jesus taught over and over and over again that we are not saved by actions, but actions can uh, give us some confidence in our salvation. But the actions, even in and of themselves, are not foolproof, as I said a moment ago. Can there be somebody who comes to church every Sunday that's not saved? They're called tares, right? Can there be somebody who is actually baptized, gone under the water, who has no faith? Saving faith? 
Yeah. How, how do I know that they're that way? Because from the time they was baptized, they've done nothing. There is no action. Right? Or a person who, who, who sits and, and, and feasts on the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine and, 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 and every Sunday, but yet are not truly converted. Could that be possible? Certainly, yes. In fact, the Bible talks about false disciples everywhere, false teachers, false false implants. I don't have the the power always to decipher that. I can only look at what's being done. I can tell people this: if there are no accompanying works whatsoever, you got a problem. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you have those works, I can say, well, it looks like you're saved and. And, and you know, I, from my standpoint, you are. <laughs> but, but you know, only God knows that heart. He's a discerner of those thoughts. So God, throughout Scripture, has set forth a series of tests by which we can test ourselves. Works are but one of them. And First John is full of these kinds of tests. Let me point out to you. Go back to First John, if you will. Uh, one of the first things is. If your faith is genuine, what will you believe about Jesus? You will believe that he is God in the flesh, won't you? See, people who tell me, oh, I believe that Jesus is God, but I, I don't think he, or I believe that Jesus is a man, but I don't think he's really God. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God, and the Word was God, right? You've got to believe both of those things. So that's a test. John started this with that. He says, that which we have heard from the beginning... Uh, what we've seen with our eyes and what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And so he, he told us that. He also talked about uh, in, in verse 5 how that not only is Jesus flesh, but he's also light. And if we have fellowship with God, we'll have that fellowship through him, through the light, won't be in darkness. That's another test. Third test he mentions here is that if we say we have, you know, it's how you view your sin. Do you think that you've arrived and you have no sin? If you think that, you're a liar. Amen. Okay? You do sin. And uh, he says, but if you confess your sin, so see, there's a test. How you view yourself. Is there ever a moment you, you don't need the blood of Christ? Is there ever a moment? You know, I talk about, I, I run into people all the time who've got this idea that I sin and then I don't sin. I sin and then I don't sin. So they're kind of in and they're out. And you better not die one second before you've confessed your sin or you're going to go to hell. Okay? And, and, and so they got this perfection kind of concept going. Scripture does not teach that. In fact, to say to believe that is probably a good indication that you don't understand what it is that you believe about Christ. And then he he talked about uh, what we saw the last time that we have an advocate with the Father who is Christ Jesus and that while we strive not to sin, we do, but our advocate is where our salvation is found. And then he, he gave us one. He says, here's another way. Are you obedient? Do you keep his commandments? It's not talking about do you keep every little commandment. They couldn't even keep ten in the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, and, and you can't either. <laughs> but is your goal to keep the commandments? And are you getting better at being obedient to the will of God? God says, come to church, then what you ought to do? Well, if you're obedient, you'll come to church. If God says, share the gospel with your friends, what do you need to do? Share the gospel with your friend or you're not being obedient. And, and we could go on and on and on. But he says those who say that they believe in God but will not keep his commandments, what are you talking about? Why would you say you believe in God when you won't do what he says? Okay? You're, you're not doing right. And now we come to another test. <laughs> and it's interesting. I think it probably goes without me saying that unbelievers naturally fail all these tests <laughs> okay overall but we turn now to a very crucial uh, one and that is if your faith is real you know how to love oh well, everybody knows how to love Sam right <coughs> love is natural to the human species 
And don't think that till you know what it means to love in a biblical sense. Which, by the way, is something you will not be able to pull off in just the power of your flesh. Let me tell you what. If we could learn to love others like we learn our, love ourselves, wouldn't we be great? You know, most people reverse that. That's Satan at work. He always takes God's truth and turns around. You've got to learn to love yourself before you love others. No, that's not what I said. You love yourself. Just learn to love everybody else like you do yourself. Okay? If you would do for them what you go out of the way to do for yourself, and if you would treat them the way you want everybody to treat you, man, you'd be spot on. But that's not usually what it is. And that's not usually how it is that we live. So the text begins with him starting out saying, listen, I'm going to write not a new commandment to you. It's kind of a play on words here. He says it's an old one. But then he turns around and he says, but it is also a new one too. What's that all about? Well, I'll tell you about that in a second. But the command to love is a command that God gave even way back in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus repeated that. The Jews knew that because on one occasion Jesus asked a lawyer to tell him what was the greatest commandment and the lawyer told him. Later, another lawyer asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment and that was what he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So it is old. As old as God is. It's eternal. Because love is God. God is love. I think we know that. But at the same time, it's also, in one sense, a new command. Because only in Christ has this been clarified as to what that love looks like. All right? You can talk about love, but do you really, really, really know what it is? So all throughout the Old Testament, they had a concept of love but they really didn't know what it was, uh, obviously, because they kept failing it. They kept falling in it. So it's new in the sense that Jesus has defined it now for us. In his person, you see what he's talking about when he says, love one another. What's that mean? Love one another as he loved you? Mm. I mean, just how far does that go, Sam? <laughs> okay. Just, just, just how... Uh, do what? But that's what he's saying. Look over in John chapter 13 for just a moment. And, and if you look at verse number 34... Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And so what we see is while it's an old command, it's an old command that's made new in the sense that in Christ now we know what that love looks like. It's defined for me in the Lord Jesus Christ. What's it mean? <laughs> How far does love go? Greater love hath no man than to what? Lay down his life for his friends. Uh oh. We can't even stand it if somebody says something mean to us without running around pouting or attacking the other person. Much less, hey, I'll die for you. Are you following me here? True love is the kind of love that Christ has. Now here, before you kind of go screaming out into the streets in despair and everybody in Duke Street will wonder what's going on over there. <laughs> thinking, I'm not there. Well, I ain't either. 
okay? I'm not either. But I know what I'm shooting for. Okay? There might be some I would die for. I'm not sure of that even. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, 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 uh, but, but you, you, you know what I'm saying? But are we perfect in any of these things? Flesh is weak, isn't it? Spirit may be willing. But I can grow in my love one toward another, right? And, and realize what my goal is, just like everything else. My goal in life is to be sinless, but I'm not sinless. My goal in life is to love you all enough to where I would die for you. Okay? But there it is. It's clarified. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friends. And what we find, if you will look over in 1 John 3... In verse 16, look at what he says there. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And, what's it say? <laughs> and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. See, listen, here's something I want you to get in your mind. If you get nothing else in your mind today, is to realize that love is not a feeling. Everybody thinks it's a feeling, because that's our culture. Okay, you know, you meet, let's use marital love for just a moment, a minute, okay? Now, Marlana and I have been married, we married 39 years, July 3rd, okay? Almost to 40. Now, what's the key to that? Do I have emotional love for her? Has that been steady for 39 years? No. <laughs> okay. Notice how brave I am when she's not here. <laughs> no books planted. <laughs> and I've been watching to see if she's signed on, so maybe maybe we'll get through this. And she goes, no, no, but I'm serious. You, some of you who are married, did, did, did you stay on that high that you had when you first met them? You know? Uh, if your spouse is with you, you may want to just ignore that question and not answer it. Um, <laughs> I can remember one time she was cleaning out the garage and was going to sell, have a yard sale. She found some love letters. I used to write her love letters. I was a romantic at heart. Can you believe that about me? That I was really a romantic? Yeah, I was, you know, moon, stars, all that kind of stuff. And anyway, but I wrote letters while I was at Eastern. Just, and she found a box of them. We'd stowed away somewhere. She was reading them one day and kind of embarrassed me. But she said, finally, well, where'd this guy go that wrote these letters? <laughs> and I said, same place a woman he wrote them to win, I guess. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because, but, but we change. The emotional I love you feeling is going to wane. I mean, that's why, you know, that, that's lust, actually. That, that, that's the lust of the flesh. And I'm not talking sexual lust. I'm just talking about that's where your flesh is. Go out and buy your best car that you can think of right now. How long do you think you're going to be satisfied with that thing? Will it be forever? <laughs> no, you're going to finally at one point somewhere, you know, when I get a new car, I wash it, I clean it, I keep it all vacuumed and everything for probably six months. And then before long, it begins to look like the old car. And then before long, I begin to think, I need a new car. Never satisfied. And, and that's the way we are if we think that love is about that. That's the way we're going to be. But see, that's not what we're being taught by Jesus to be like. And in fact, I'm going to go you one further, one step further. You realize that the love that we need is already in us. The seed is there. Romans says that the Holy Spirit has shed the love of God abroad in our hearts. It's there. But it's like everything else. It's got to be what? Developed. Okay? To, 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 to grow. So the love of Christ is now in us. Look at what he says in verse 8. On the other hand, I'm writing, uh, this is back in chapter 2. Uh, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and what? And in you. Because the darkness is passing away and light has dawned. Through the Spirit, we now have the capacity to love as he does. The darkness is past. And the reason the darkness has passed is because our eyes have been opened. Who opened your eyes, by the way? You just smart enough to figure this stuff out on your own? You're just a little biblical genius? 
Okay? Is that how you got it? Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. And if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those who are perishing. Because if you see it, it's not hidden. And you won't be perishing anymore. You receive it. He says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of, the, uh, of His gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul says, We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Christ's sake. For God who said, Let or for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, that's in the beginning, creation of the world, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. An illumination provided by God through the Spirit. So now the Spirit has illuminated us and given us the understanding of, of, of who this is. So what he says is, this is how you know that you are in the light and not in darkness when you start learning how to live. He says, if you say that you're in the light, but you hate your brother, he says in verse 9, you're in darkness. Till now, that's, that's just another way of saying you're not saved. You're deceiving yourself. You're under deception. We've got to love. Now what's that mean? We've got to love even our enemies. What's that mean? Well, if you're, you're, if you're hanging around over here in, in the American culture's view of love, and it's a feeling, none of this is making any sense to you at all. Because love is not a feeling. Love is a verb. It's not what you feel. It's not an noun. It can be used that way. But biblical love is a verb. It's all about action. It's not about what you feel. It's about what you do. How do you treat other people? How do you treat other people? the people in your life even the enemies you have you know I can remember really struggling with when Jesus says love your enemies now I always thought well how am I going to feel good about somebody who's out to get me somebody who wants to hurt me but he didn't say I had to feel good about them he said pray for them bless them if you see them hungry, feed them. If you see them thirsty, give them something to drink. It was about what I did to that person. Not how I felt about that person. And if I do the right things to that person, feelings always catch up. Listen, we do not live, we are not in a religion that is founded on feelings. That's not to say feelings are not involved. God made the emotional man just like he made the intellectual man. But listen, it's intellect that drives the ship. It's what you know that drives the boat, not what you feel. Okay? So there is true love, which, as the apostle says here, is from the light. Look at verse 10. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling. Then there's the false love, but the one who hates his brother, he says... Is in the darkness. So you've got the false professor and you have the true professor. But how do I know that I'm telling everybody I love them and whether I really do or not? Oh, Satan's crafty in all this stuff, isn't he? And you know, there are people I really do have fond feelings for. Okay? <laughs> but they're few and far between. <laughs> Okay, admit it. <laughs> We're not fond of everybody in our circle, are we? <laughs> you know, we're just not. We're afraid to admit those kinds of things, but we're just not. But I can still love them. It's not about a fondness. It's about how I relate to them. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. 
And if you want a full exposition of this, we have these sermons. But if you'll notice, he says in verse 4, love is patient. You patient with people? People who really get on the last little nerve that you've got. You patient with them? Long suffering? It's kind. Think about what you say to these people in your life. Would you consider it kindness? If I come in and say, Ryan, you moron, I just can't hardly believe you did that. <laughs> Would you consider that a kind act? <laughs> No. Or if I said, Sarge, you're driving me nuts. Get away from me. Would that be kind or patient, either one? No. <laughs> Sarge loves me too. Isn't that good? It's not jealous. Well, I mean, why, why'd they get that? You ever done that? Not <laughs> fair. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's not fair. I ought to be the one that... Right? We've had that happen. But you won't be that way if you love. Love does not brag. Let me tell you what I did. Okay? Have you ever talked to people that you can't even get a word in anywhere to tell them what you did because they're telling you too much about what they did and they started first? Yes. When neither one of you should be talking about what you did, you should be talking about what others do that is noteworthy, does not act unbecomingly, you know, uh, does not seek its own, is not selfish, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Oh, what about them record books we keep? Do you remember, I think it was July the 8th, 1975. <laughs> if I remember correctly. You said... <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. Right? I mean, sometimes me and Marlene get going at it. She said, do you remember the time that... And I'm sitting there thinking, no, I really don't. Uh, I've learned not to say that. <laughs> okay. And, and then by the time I push it and got to get it out of her, it was like when I was 17 or something. You know, all right. So then I want to say, you always do this. You keep records of everything. Then I start listing all the things that I remember about her. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? We're, we're good at doing that. He says, don't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoice with the truth. You bear all things. What's all things mean? No. Believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. That's your Lord. He, he, he beautifully, beautifully keeps every one of those traits. That's his trait. That's God. That's God. And we have that living within us. It's been put there. But you've got to grow it. Okay? You've got to practice it. It's like any skilled activity. The more you do, the better you become at it. Right? See, there's so much of this that's intellectual and knowing and doing and not feeling. You know, I can't control my feelings. You know, there's times when people, I get impatient. There's times I want to strike back. But, you know, I, I, I catch myself saying, no, I can't do that. I shouldn't do that. So, bear it. I sit there quietly. Okay. Then there's other times when I make a complete idiot out of myself and show that at that moment I was not under the Spirit's control. I let the flesh take me over. Right? But I want those moments to decrease. And I want the godly moments to increase. To where, and yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of a sign of age. The older I get, the less things fire me up like it did years ago. You know? Yeah, I think it's just... You get seasoned after a while, but it's also the Holy Spirit's working in you. He's maturing you, and I'm thankful for that. So, what about it, church? Love. You walking in light or in darkness? Remember, I'm not requiring, you know, he's not requiring from you perfection in this love, but pray on it. 
Strive toward it. Seek to eliminate areas where that love does not show up. Let's ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. Help us to love one another. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind because we know that by doing this that we are showing ourselves to be uh, your people and that we bring glory to your name's sake and we become like our Lord and our Savior. Thank you for your word. Bless us in our hearing of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Turn with me 597 in our old book. We'll sing the first and the fourth verse. <clears throat>